Hello and welcome. My name is Danish Bahati. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Neurological Sciences at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And I am here with Professor John Bertoni, MD, PhD, uh, who has a unique background in both clinical care and research in medicine. And the purpose of this talk to sit down with him is to review some basic information as a guide for medical students to get started with research or even residents or trainees who have not had any background in research before and they're struggling with how to get their foot in the door to get them an idea of what is research, what's the landscape of research, what are the types, how to get started and other tips and tricks which are practical and useful. So this will not be a comprehensive review of the research itself but only very practical and relevant information for a medical student or a trainee to get just started and then they can you know hopefully continue our journey of learning more and more about it. Do you want to introduce yourself and something relevant to this? I'm John Bertoni and I began medicine very interested in clinical work. I did some summer jobs working in laboratories, everything from cleaning out rat cages and dog cages wow. to doing uh, you know more refined things, uh, mostly on the brain, some cardiology and vascular kind of work I did over the summers. but when I got to see patients for the first time, that's where my focus turned. I, I did some research on development of the brain had a, a teacher investigator development award from the NIH. But once I got into clinical medicine, I used some of those techniques to solve clinical problems on patients. But uh, what I do now is mostly patient-centered and then mentoring and helping uh, younger people, the students and the residents, get their foot in the door, like you say. So I think from the get-go, we can divide research and explain that there is the bench research which right. is lab either right. with an animal or just with a petri dish right. with a culture and you're right. doing things with microscope and and genetic testing and, and chemical reactions and whatnot right then there is the clinical research where you're working right. with the patient either with a patient data or patient themselves live and accumulating data. Sure. And then there is what is called a translational research where a bench scientist comes and works with a clinician mm -hmm. to test their ideas on live patients. So you have to have a background in how that product was created, right. which right. is a, the bench researcher, and then a clinical application of right. it in measurement right. and a translational research. I think we're probably going to focus mostly on the clinical research, right. not as much on the right. translational bench research because that's, you know, you need to have a lab, you need to have you right. know, compounds and chemicals and animal models and, and things like that. Right. No, I think that's a good place to start because most of us are really in this from the medical aspect as medical students and residents. We're seeing patients. That's what we're going to be doing. But to have the ability to advance knowledge enough so that we're helping patients more because of the, let's say, multi-center studies that we've been doing with the Movement Disorders Society or the Parkinson Study Group, those kind of things are really gratifying. Yeah. So, you know, this uh, idea for this talk came from this basic questions from uh, a couple of medical students from mm -hmm. my medical school. Sure. And they reached out to me and they said, they need to understand how to get started with research and not only just for themselves but they wanted to create a program to help with right. all medical students and create a culture of research in medical school sure. uh, which, they, which they saw missing. Alright, well there's a couple of approaches. I think if you have experts at your medical school that are inspiring to you and are doing good work uh, and have openings or will let you work with them, you can see what they do from day to day. They can teach you some of the techniques that they have and you can see how they use it and how do they expect that it's going to be helping patients. That's one way. Find a mentor, find somebody that's inspiring, that's doing really good work and is published uh, and they can show you the ropes kind of how to get started. The other side of it, I think, if I can interject that here, if you run into an interesting patient mm. that you are 
really learning about their illness or their uh, whatever it is that they have or deficiency state, whatever it may be, then you can learn how to study that patient and find other patients like them. For example, you find somebody with a low vitamin B1 and you really wonder, well, how did they get that? They're not the typical patient that we hear about. And then you find, well, maybe are there others like them? And you write a case report, a case series. And then sometimes I have actually found clinicians that might be good to measure, let's say, ophthalmologists that can measure the visual problems with vitamin deficiency, let's say vitamin A deficiency or vitamin whatever deficiency. They can test to see if there's improvement with the patient. Okay. So, yeah. you know, if I summarize, uh, there are two main approaches. One, you can join someone who's already doing right. good clinical research and help them with what they're doing and that will get you started and it will be a lot of learning through that. Or the other approach is to find a, a burning question, something that really inspires you. It could be a patient case, it could be a patient question, it could be a medical care issue. Uh, and I just want to add that if you are in your first two years of medical school and you are only in the classroom learning about anatomy and physiology and you're wondering how am I going to get a clinical question, well, you can do rotations and electives. You don't have to bind yourself to what you're asked to do. You can reach out and say, I want to go to the emergency room or I want to shadow someone. You can reach out to someone in ophthalmology, neurology, cardiology and say, can I shadow you? Can I see some clinics with you? Can I, in the afternoon, can I join you in the clinic? And that way you can exposed to a kind of patients that interest you uh, early on and that may immediately jump you give you an idea either you will see an interesting case like you were saying and you right. say okay wow I didn't know that this existed or this is very interesting to me right. and you ask your clinical mentor uh, a question about that and if you feel there is a missing gap of information uh, and you go up online and look if there is an answer to that gap if not that you can make that a study question so right. a start with a question something inspired you mm -hmm. or B find someone already doing something and just join them to learn the ropes right and you know that some people go to medical school because there's been an illness of some type in the family and that is an interesting thing to get them going on it and if it's your passion you should follow your passion if you're really interested in something go into it you know head first if you're taking courses and you're in the first couple of years of medical school, make sure you do well in those courses. But for the time off, if there's a summer off, make sure that you can do something that's going to advance your career and inspire you to work even harder. We, we get students rotate with us, right? Sure. We get requests for preceptorship or electives in their first year or second year medical school right. students. They want to just experience what the clinical neurology is like because they are interested in neurology early right. on. Yes. They may come in for one day or two days or maybe a week at a time. Maybe here at the med school they have a formalized program for them to do it. Mm -hmm. And maybe in other medical schools or in your medical school there is not a formal structure. Right. But you probably can find half a day or sure. one day free right. uh, where you just don't have anything else to do or no classes. And you can take that opportunity. If you plan for it, you know, it will show up and go and, and visit a clinic. Right. No, I think there are a lot of opportunities, uh, and I think a medical school should provide opportunities. Sure. In other words, there's anything from what are the ethics you need to know about even animal research, and uh, particularly for people. I mean, especially people that are ill or may not be uh, mentally fully capable, there are rules you've got to follow, but yeah. basically uh, you would treat them in general like you would like to be treated but still there should be courses in that available yeah. and in some <clears> techniques <throat> and then later on how to write a good paper how to write a good uh, abstract how to write a good uh, uh, proposal for funding so um, I want to uh, get some guidance on both of these approaches a little bit before I move on to another question one is that if someone decides I'm going to go for option A and find someone who's doing good research right. and join them, what's a way someone can find a good research in their institution or outside their institution? Ask around. I mean, try to find out from anybody you can. I mean, I did things beginning with washing test tubes uh, and just hanging out with people 
and uh, they were doing, uh, one of the things I did was we were studying a new uh, hormone, uh, erythropoietin. Nobody had ever heard of it before. And so they were trying to test how do we know how much it's going to increase the red blood cell count. So what we did was we had lots of little mice and my job was to put them into a hypobaric chamber uh -huh. to take them up to high altitude so they were maximizing how many red cells they had. And then my job was to inject something that we took from a patient with, let's say, renal artery stenosis that was producing this hormone. How much was there? It was a bioassay. So we'd inject like 50 mice with this and then we would see how much their hematocrits would go up. So, I mean, there's all sorts of things, but it's how do you take an idea and test it in the real world? But here, like you're saying, that we're thinking about finding someone who's already doing yes. good work. Yes. So, by asking around, asking your seniors, yes. if someone delivered a talk, walking up to them and saying, are you doing any research right now actively? Right, right. If you are... Uh, if you know someone who is a resident in, a, in the program, in a ward, where let's say you want to do research in neurology, sure. you can go to neurology ward and knock on the door, walk into the assistant professor or resident trainee and right. say, uh, is there any research project going on around and get right. an idea of different research projects and see if you can join one sure. and, and learn the ropes by, by, by even washing the test tubes. Yes, but and, yes, you have to be careful and you have to not talk too much. If you're just going to be standing there observing and if you're doing it appropriately, then you can ask questions when the patient is out of the room, when you're not in the OR, whatever it is. The other way I found is when I heard a really outstanding lecture from a neurosurgeon, Yeah he was making lesions in the brain to take care of Parkinson's disease before we had deep brain stimulation. And I just went up to him and after a, a lecture and he was telling me and showing me things and I got in the OR with him and saw the big bank of not transistorized, this was way back when there were tubes, and I actually assisted him and changed the dials and did things that he wanted. Yeah. Uh, and so if you know somebody, just go up, introduce yourself, and say, I'm interested, uh, do you need an extra hand? What can I do? Uh, and then, as long as you are appropriate, and they need somebody, they probably have a team where they're just looking for somebody to wash test tubes, or whatever it is, whatever it is. But then you can sit in on the meetings, and you can get into it, and you can see how they're behaving. There's all sorts of ways. Now, there are probably better ways now, but Ultimately, you've got to interact with a person that knows a lot more than you and just let it soak in. And I think when you start with it, you, you have to get your foot in the door and you may have to take the most menial, meaningless job, mm -hmm. but that's how you're being tested. Right. If you show your persistence, if you show your patience, your right. interest, you know, a lot of people are not sure when you walk up to them, how serious are you, mm -hmm. how reliable are you, how hardworking are you, are you going to be a problem for them, right. because, you know, their work is already going on. Right. So they may test you for a while, they may give you something small, but if you persist, if you show up, then they will give you increasing tasks gradually once you prove yourself at every stage. Right. You have to be careful. You can't be taken advantage of. But then again, when that person writes a note about you because if you've worked with them they'll write a letter of recommendation for you and if you were always appropriate always polite always doing your job very well and asking a lot of good questions you want them to be able to say those kind of good things about you I mean that's not the reason you're doing it because you love it you want to learn things but in the process People will be impressed by your work ethic, uh, about how well you interact with the group. All those things are very, very important. And uh, I happen to know somebody in our medical school, but for the first couple of years, I spent my summers doing those kind of jobs. And then I just kept doing yeah. those things. So I want to keep pointing out that as we talk through this, I think one important thing to always keep in mind is that why do research? Why, why is it so important? And we just actually touched on three important reasons. Uh, one, you might actually love it. You might actually enjoy it. And if you try it, you'll find out that it's really great. 
Um, the second important thing is you, you get to know some really wonderful people. You network with them. You, you, you find out about more opportunity through them. And then thirdly, which is a practical importance, is that you might get a very good letter of recommendation. If somebody is doing a research, he might be an important person in his field or in the department or in the institution and may be recognized by other people. And you may get a good letter of recommendation rather than a generic letter that everybody else will get. Right. Very, very true. I mean, anything you do, you got to do it with your whole heart or else do something else. If you're not really into it, it'll be obvious to people and they'll say, you know, he doesn't seem interested. He's not doing the hard work as well as the fun work. And so you want to be that person. You want to be the one that people would like you to work with them again the next year or would like to give you more and more responsibility. And I think we all know what we're talking about here. You've got to give uh, and then you'll get. So let's talk about the option B. Let's say that you are of a, a curious mind and you do run into an interesting case right. or an interesting question. Actually, most interesting questions are triggered by that one patient. Yes. And then you start asking and see that you, you can generalize it to other patients and then to many patients. Um, so how do you come up with a question? And how do you know this is an important, worthwhile question to pursue? Okay, I'll try to give the Cliff Notes version of this. I was given uh, by, a, by a resident that was leaving our program at University of Michigan, this case. He says, it's a spinal cerebellar degeneration. And I said, oh boy, I want to learn about those. So I read about him, and this patient wasn't anything that was written about. And then I got the old record and I went into it and I found out that at about 18 months of age she had an abdominal catastrophe and they had to remove almost all the small intestine. So then I started reading about the literature and there is a rat model for vitamin E deficiency that caused what she had. She had a scoliosis. Uh, and there were other things wrong with her. Uh, so I got to noticing and we got a vitamin E level that was not, it was hardly detectable. So then, then I had to figure out, well, how can I do something for this person? And then I found out that the other fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, her visual fields over the years have been found to start out normal and then get smaller and smaller and smaller with time. And there were people working with the ophthalmology department that I got on the case and then I got a GI specialist on the case and we had biopsies and we did other things and then I got other people on the case and we wrote up a protocol had her come in and we did all sorts of things. So that was the first published case of vitamin E deficiency in, presenting in with neurological problems right, like ataxia right. in adults. Yes. Um, how do you take that experience and generalize it? So what was it about this case that you think made it worthwhile pursuing okay. or interesting to you? Well, first of all, it was a fooler because a very good resident thought it was just a spinal cerebellar degeneration. And you know what? So was vitamin B12 deficiency at one time. And eventually, okay, they have higher, you know, they have all sorts of other changes. They got a neuropathy, they got ataxia, but uh, they eventually found out that it was uh, from lack of vitamin B12 and then they take it out of the spinal cerebellar degeneration box. And so it's no longer thought to be one of those, but it really is. And so if you have a patient and you have an idea, well look, we found a really low vitamin, how about if we check vitamin D, vitamin K, vitamin E, and we find out that those are abnormal too, and say, well wait a minute, she looks just like these other patients, what if we give her all of these things and her visual fields went back toward normal with, a, with enough, and I had an ophthalmologist making sure we gave the right doses. So how do the students, you know, generalize, you know, how do they run into a case and well, what can they do to figure out it's an well, interesting case? Well, even in the first and second year, uh, you can probably trail along with the rest of the team and see how things go. Hello. Hello, we're on so, camera. All right, so we'll stop because we have audience okay. for the next.